right, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to the last, uh, the last session in the meeting. It's, uh, you guys are diehards for staying this long. We really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, co-chair this with uh, I'm Asim Ziadi, a uh, professor of, pedi of pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's, and I'm co-chairing with Emily DeBoer, DeBoer um, who's at uh, University of Colorado. And um, we wanted to bring to you uh, a session on um, how biomarkers can be a useful uh, approach to looking at CF in the new world of high efficacy modulators. And so um, our goal was to try to put together a set of sessions that gave you a sense of uh, the different technologies people are using to look at this problem. So we're dealing with the same disease. The disease hasn't changed, but the way the disease looks and how different people are responding to the different therapies um, is not that well known by us yet. And one of the ways you could explore that is by using, um, or looking at biomarkers or using omic, omic technologies um, that we'll discuss a little bit today. So we'll hear a little bit about metabolomic approaches, proteomic approaches, clinical approaches to looking at how people are responding to the therapies and uh, how we could potentially make it better. So hope you enjoy the session. Thanks, awesome. It's great to be here with you and all of the rest of you who are still here on Saturday afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure um, to invite up Dr. Joshua Chandler, um, who's an assistant professor of pediatrics at Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And he's going to kick us off today and talk about metabolomics. Thank you, Emily. Um, okay. I couldn't do both at the same time. Gotcha, that's okay. There we go. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm excited to present some uh, data fr from the Synergy CF Consortium today. Um, this will be pertaining to, uh, as Awesome referred to, uh, metabolomics. Uh, and the role that they may play serving as biomarkers for predicting structural lung disease in early CF. Um, to kick things off, I just want to say I have nothing relevant to disclose and cover a brief outline. Um, I'm going to introduce structural lung disease in cystic fibrosis and talk a little bit about its importance. I'm going to also cover um, some background on conventional biomarkers that have been established for structural lung disease in early CF. I'll tell you about the preserved cohort that was the patient population we looked at in the study, our conventional biomarker and LCMS-based measurements, and the statistics we have used for analyzing these data. I'll cover the conventional and metabolite biomarker results, and I'll provide some conclusions. So to introduce structural lung disease in early CF to a crowd that predominantly knows it already, I'm sure, um, this is a uh, aspect of the disease that is typified by bronchiectasis and many other kinds of obstructive changes in the lungs. And there's a diagram to the right you can see uh, from NHLBI that shows a, a healthy airway uh, on the top and then a thickened, enlarged, and uh, obstructed airway on the bottom. And we expect that to be obstructed in part by a mucoperinolate phlegm containing inflammatory exudate uh, and effector proteins. And what's important to note about structural lung disease is it's not necessarily predictable based on things that are um, well known about a patient such as their CFTR genotype. So we need to identify factors that can allow us to uh, better make such predictions before disease advances so we can advance personal care. So as far as biomarkers that we do have for structural lung disease and early CF already, um, there are a few. Uh, this is a table taken from a New England Journal of Medicine publication in 2013 uh, from the arrest CF cohort. Uh, clinically stable surveillance BAL at three months of age was used to assess the odds ratio for future bronchiectasis development at either one year of age or three years of age. And the best odds ratio that they found belonged to neutrophil elastase either at one or three years. Um, you can see that's been highlighted by me in some purple boxes. And this was whether they took a univariate or a multivariate test approach. So this is very nice. Um, the issue is that this was a presence or absence analysis. And so there's not really much granularity to, OK, if neutrophil elastase activity was detected, is a little bit bad and a lot even worse? Or you know what's going on there? This wasn't able to establish that. And in part because of the anti-protease shield that's established early on in CF that may go away later, that makes this um, you know, somewhat less sensitive as well. So 
The goal of this study was to evaluate whether metabolites in lipids can complement what we already have, looking at both early and late stage preschool, and serve as highly sensitive biomarkers for future bronchiectasis. So let me tell you a little bit about, about the cohort that we studied. This was called Preserve, and it was set up as part of the ARREST CF uh, program in Melbourne. And so 58 patients' uh, CT scans at the age of nine were reviewed there by uh, three of the colleagues involved in the study. And they established very carefully whether any of them had bronchiectasis or no bronchiectasis at that time. 14 were found to not have bronchiectasis and 14 others who did have bronchiectasis were carefully matched based on sex, CFDR genotype, pancreatic insufficiency, and in all cases, a lack of a chronic pseudomonas infection um, to the 14 without bronchiectasis. So then because they'd been in RSCF, they had annual surveillance BAL from the ages of zero to six, and we were able to look at that retrospectively. Conventional biomarker data had been collected. We added on discovery LCMS, lipidomic and metabolomic analyses here. Just very briefly characterizing what we did as far as the LCMS, um, the metabolomic side, we found 114 uh, markers that were, or metabolites that we had validated previously with reference standards that also passed QC thresholds in this data set. Um, we also technically ha uh, validated them with another LCMS method. Um, and additionally, things that I won't be able to talk about today, there are a large number of known unknowns in this data set that could offer some additional information we'll keep exploring. And the lipidomic data that complemented that was 517 lipids, also assayed by LCMS, and had a class-specific inst internal standards, so this had a quantitative uh, property as well. Statistics that were applied included centered log ratio transformation of all the data to give it a normal or normal-like distribution, univariate and multivariate analyses, and what's important to point out is that we averaged data points from zero, one, and two years, or three, four, and five years for some of the analyses, and I've indicated them here, so that would be the t-test, the receiver operating characteristic, and the multivariate, in order to deal with the fact that some patients might have had a missing value here or there. So there might have been not a one year, but a zero and a two, or a one and a two, but not a zero. Uh, so those, those data points were averaged into one value for some of these measurements, like the t-test, again. However, like mixed effects models, when you see that, that's everything individually dealing with repeated measures. I'll also explain for the multivariate, pardon me, let's see if I can go back. The multivariate was just a partial least squares discriminant analysis that included multiple data sets at one time. This is a mixed omics package called Diablo. Okay, first of all, how did the conventional biomarkers perform? Uh, you can see neutrophil elastase, percentage of neutrophils in IL-8 are here. If we look at the early preschool time points, they do not perform very well. So between zero and two, all the areas under the curve for each of these are below 0.7. And so these do not seem to be giving us a sensitive prediction of uh, whether a patient will develop bronchiectasis or not. In the late preschool age, they perform very nicely. So three to five years old, um, a neutrophil elastase in particular has a fantastic AUC of 0.93, and the others do well also. So really the problem is simply that they're just not sensitive um, early, but they do become fairly sensitive. This is another look at the same data through mixed effects. Uh, if we look at zero to two, we have um, a non-significant p-value for each of these. If you look at the entire age range where, um, again, red, the red line is bronchiectasis, the black line is no bronchiectasis for each of the markers, um, then looking at everything uh, up to six years of age, these are significant. So really it's just a lack of sensitivity in the early time points that is causing problems. When we added in the metabolites and lipids and compared them to the uh, conventional biomarkers, this bore out again in that the conventional biomarkers do not um, give a PLS and 0.05 result, let alone uh, what you see in parentheses here is the FDR uh, filtered data, so down to 10% FDR. Um, you don't see anything for conventional biomarkers. You do see results for metabolites and lipids, both um, raw P.05 and FDR uh, significant. And that's true for whether you look at t-tests or mixed effects. Um, it gets even better in all cases as patients age, and that signal to noise for the disease prediction seems to go up. But the metabolites and lipids show up much earlier. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on the early preschool side, and we'll look at multivariate analyses and what that told us. So again, Diablo is a PLSDA uh, uh, package that allows us to um, use a multivariate approach to um, study these metabolites and lipids in tandem. And so you can see that in both cases, lipids or metabolites were able to discriminate through partial least squares uh, discriminant analysis bronchiectasis from non-bronchiectasis. And 
when we looked at the metabolites that were important in this model, uh, we found that there were actually some clusters of metabolites that were really interesting and moving together, meaning they were, uh, their abundances were tightly linked. And you can see that here because the, the plot is showing red for a strong correlation between a metabolite or lipid and blue for a strong inverse correlation. And I've superimposed some dashed line triangles where I saw these large clusters of molecules that were behaving similarly. And then on the left-hand side, there are these blue or red lines labeled one, two, and three that correspond to groups of molecules that either went down, and that's blue, if uh, the patient developed bronchiectasis later, or red um, going up if the patient developed bronchiectasis later. So the first big cluster is an interesting one because it contains a lot of purines. Purines have been noted in CF um, as a biomarker for many years, um, and in CF airways specifically. Um, additionally, it contains sulfur antioxidants, glutathione, and taurine, and these are important redox buffers, and we know that they're disrupted in CF as well. So it kind of makes sense, I think, especially in the latter case, that things are going down in the patients who develop bronchiectasis. Then we also have a big group of long-chain triacylglycerols. That's the second cluster, and that was interesting to see them all moving together like that. Um, and then finally, in the third set, we have very long chain lactosyl ceramides, very long chain triacylglycerols, and covalently modified amino acids like methionine sulfoxide and N acetylmethionine. So I'm going to focus a bit on that third set because it was really interesting for us to look at that and see well, what kind of uh, molecular signatures are that is that indicating to us about what might be driving disease development. Of course, all these are interesting and we'll keep pursuing them, but in, for the interest of time, we're going to focus on that third cluster. So the lipid that was actually the most important in uh, the SPLS model was lactosyl ceramide, 24 colon 1. So that means it has a 24 carbon acyl chain, one double bond. This is actually known as CD17. It's enriched in neutrophil membranes. It's forming microdomains that enable pattern recognition for phagocytosis and chemotaxis to occur. And you can see that even in isolation, uh, taken out of the PLS model, it's got a great area under the curve. Um, and the mixed effects model is good even in the early preschool age. And the metabolite that was the most important in the model was methionine sulfoxide. Um, this is an oxidized form of methionine that builds up whenever hypochlorous acid reacts with methionine. Um, and we know that that comes probably from MPO activity. Um, and it's interesting, too, because it's a chiral product, so it actually has uh, chiral-specific repair mechanisms, which is always an interesting thing to think about. Um, but that being said, it has a, a really uh, good ROC curve as well, good mixed effects prediction of uh, BX uh, from the early preschool age. And looking a bit deeper, we knew that methionine sulfoxide, we had previously connected to myeloperoxidase in a 2018 paper in European Respiratory Journal. And uh, I have some background in myeloperoxidase research as well. And so I've just kind of got a, a diagram here showing neutrophil release of hydrogen peroxide uh, or generation through like respiratory burst, actually, and release of myeloperoxidase through exocytosis. And this is the process that's responsible, regardless of hydrogen peroxide source, um, via MPO making hypochlorous acid. And then if we look at um, myeloperoxidase protein activity, that actually performs well even on its own in the mixed effects. And importantly, if you look at the correlation to the right, we can see a strong correlation between methionine sulfoxide uh, abundance and myeloperoxidase activity, suggesting that these two things are indeed connected and agreeing with prior observations from that 2018 paper. But importantly, if we put all the metabolites that were important in the uh, PLS model or all the lipids important in the model together, we had really strong areas under the curve of 0.97 and 0.99, suggesting that when we look at these molecules in aggregate, we get really good prediction uh, at a very young age of whether patients are going to develop bronchiectasis years later. So to form some conclusions, uh, we identified hundreds of biomarkers of future structural lung disease that outperformed conventional biomarkers uh, in early preschool age. So that includes neutrophil elastase, um, percent PMNs, things that we are, are great, but we, we think we might have improved on with some of these. Um, the results support previous findings um, that we had already begun to make with cross-sectional anal analyses in structural lung disease. So for example, methionine sulfoxide, lactate, purines, and N-acetyl amino acids had previously been noted um, in several studies. And other things, like, like the lactosyl ceramides here from the lipidome, they add some new depth. And I, I think they expand the picture of what we need to be paying attention to in structural lung disease uh, biomarkers. Uh, in fact, a lot of the biomarkers we analyzed tie back in some way to 
neutrophils, and perhaps they, especially thinking about that cluster from uh, a few slides back uh, on the correlation graph, they may suggest a common uh, cellular and molecular process or processes that are tightly linked. Um, and so the lactosal ceramides, methionine sulfoxide, and, and others might be uh, things to hone in on for biomarkers and maybe also thinking about therapeutic interventions. Of course, our study definitely had limitations. There's a small sample size here. Uh, we need to validate that with a bigger uh, independent cohort at some point. Um, we're missing values for some time points, as we discussed. There was transient bronchiectasis in a few of the patients who did not have it when they were age nine. About half of the patients had it for at least one visit, and then it went away. And of course, our results do not establish causation. Uh, lastly, I'd like to make some acknowledgments. This is a, a very big endeavor by a lot of people uh, listed here. And I was very grateful to be uh, a part of this team. Um, certainly, uh, everyone on here contributed massively to this. And um, I want to just call out, in particular, a couple of the trainees who were important. Uh, Joseph uh, Ho from Telephone Kids for data analysis and Susan Kim from Emory University for mass spec analyses. But really uh, grateful to all these individuals and, of course, children and families uh, who participated and our funding from the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council, as well as NIH, CFF, and um, CF Atlanta for covering some of the instrumentation costs. So with that, I will just add that we, uh, we are looking to hire a postdoc in Emory, at Emory in immunometabolism. So think about it. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, that was excellent. We're getting questions in the app, so feel free to um, submit your questions in the app, and there's extra microphones if you feel so compelled. Um, I, had a, I had a question. Um, it seems like you told us the infant data didn't, the data from the infants didn't correlate as well with bronchiectasis as the early preschool. So do you think metabolomics isn't finding something that's there in the infants that's predestined or something's happening during that key age group that predicts, that determines who goes on to get worse bronchiectasis. Oh, so and basically what why? do we do about it? So, I, right, so I think in this case, the, I mean, the encouraging thing is that even though some of the markers like neutrophil elastase don't seem to perform very well in that age range, we really did see um, quite sensitive results for things like methionine sulfoxide and lactosal ceramide, even in like three months of age. Um, so the, I think the challenge is just going to be, you know, sample access and thinking about like, how do we, how do we keep that momentum going and translate that? But otherwise, I think um, these data suggest that the metabolites and lipids, um, from my standpoint, are, are a, a, a substantial improvement on what we had access to. So hopefully we can keep that momentum going. Did that answer your question? Um. I think that was an excellent answer. <laughs> Cheers. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Well, how about some questions online here? We're trying to figure out how to use this app. So, so Mara Lakovich uh, um, Scrogan um, is asking, uh, she says, uh, good, good, good that you see signals in a small sample set. Are you thinking about assays that don't involve a bronch? Less invasive sampling would be a good thing. Absolutely. I mean, I think we've heard repeatedly at this meeting about, you know, that there's some and whether, whether you define sputum as invasive, non-invasive, or kind of halfway invasive, the sputum might be um, also challenging to access for some reasons. Um, but maybe, you know, that would be a, a, an option. I would also say we're definitely, and we're aggressively exploring exhaled breath condensate. Um, and we have a lot of promise with that. Um, and what is, of course, important to note about exhaled breath condensate is it does sample different parts of the airway than uh, bronchoalveolar lavage. So, Although we see the same metabolites in exhaled breath that we see in BAL oftentimes, we don't necessarily, um, well, it's gonna take work to really link up what we've seen in BAL with that because we're probably getting more signal from the, the open and less diseased airways than we might with BAL. Um, Robert Gray asked an, a compelling question. Do you have to correct for anything in the BAL, how much fluid went in, how, much fluid you have, concentration. Yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking, the approach has been that like urea and other approaches are like uh, total protein are, they, they sounded attractive, but when investigated 
carefully, there are some serious limitations with them, such as uh, correlations with the inflammatory burden. Um, and so I think the approach in general has been to standardize the BAL procedure. Um, I would have to double check for this particular study, but in, in prior work from surveillance BAL, the approach has been to use the right middle lobe and a standard um, volume per kilogram body weight to um, try to keep this as consistent as possible. I don't know if any of my colleagues can speak to that with a little more detail, but I think, think it would, that would be my answer for that. Yeah, it's fantastic. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, oh, thanks. Yes. Uh, and are there any differences in the infection status at any of the you know, time points between those who developed bronchiectasis and those who did not? Um, the answer is no, there were, did not appear any difference, to be any differences. First of all, there was no chronic uh, infections with pseudo, um, but we did have, I think, a few patients who were on, uh, had staph at one point or another. However, um, when we looked at that carefully, there were no significant differences from either group. Josh, I have a question. So the methionine uh, sulfoxide is pretty interesting. Uh, in the uh, modifier gene study that Mike Knowles and uh, Gary Cutton and Mitch, Mitch Drum did uh, years ago, they, they found that as a, as a SNP. It was mm -hmm. a hit. Um, in a, I mean, the most known one of those was the TGF beta, but the reductase was actually one that. Did you look at SNPs in your patients at all for the reductase? Um, I don't think we have SNP data in this particular okay. cohort. Um, we did, however, look into uh, that in uh, a bit in the previous paper in terms of, I think it was not the MSR gene, but I want to say it was uh, meth it was one of the genes responsible for methionine recycling from s methionine to replenish the methionine pool. So that was an, another uh, GWAS identified mm -hmm. gene, I believe. Mm -hmm. So um, it does seem like between methionine and the polyamines, there, there's some kind of common metabolic hub that probably does matter a lot in lung disease and CF. It's a good question. We've got more time for questions if you guys have any. You can just yell them from the seat. We have these. Just wondering, do you think any of these metabolites are therapeutic targets rather than just being a, a sign of inflammation? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have to admit to some bias because I've been working on myeloproxidase for years, but I'm, um, I was excited um, and a bit gratified or uh, affirmed to see that methionine sulfoxide came up here because, as I alluded to, Methionine is not something that is um, readily oxidizable in a physiological system by any old oxidant. It actually takes an oxidant that is uh, like hypochlorous acid to um, really achieve high levels in vivo. Um, that's just because all the other oxidants have better targets. Um, and myeloproxidase is special because it's the only protein in our bodies with the heme reduction potential high enough that it can make hypochlorous acid from chloride in its milieu. Any other uh, related gene that we express, like uh, lactoproxidase, can't do that. So anytime we see a methionine sulfoxide signal in the airway milieu, to me it screams hypochlorous acid. And that means we might have some ability to target that um, either with maybe, you know, either targeting MPO activity, targeting um, hypochlorous acid levels with antioxidants, or I'm also kind of a proponent of what I call oxidant switching, where we might try to uh, put in something like thiocyanate that would push hypochlorous acid to an alternative oxidant that epithelial cells can receive and uh, react to more appropriately, maybe uh, res pro-resolving rather than tissue damage. Hmm? Do that. Can you postulate on how the metabolomics might change with modulators, and, and is that study planned, undergoing? Yeah, I think that there's multiple versions of that study that um, either are ongoing or planned that I'm happy to be involved with. Um, and I, I can tell you that when we looked at adult sputum with uh, trikafta or no trikafta, uh, there's actually a poster on this. That I, I think posters are coming down soon, so it might be too late to go check it out. but. Um, we have a poster here, and uh, it, it looks like a lot of the signals remain, yet their intensity diminishes. So it's kind of like a partial rescue. Um, I also imagine there might be some prolongation of the natural history of the disease when this is introduced in youngsters. And so it might be that we see these same signals, but they come later. That'd be my speculation. Sounds great. Thanks for all the great questions Thanks. and for fielding so many for us. Uh, it was fun. Thanks, Josh. <laughs>
I feel comfortable with the right middle lobe, lobe lavash, but mm -hmm. were you at the spit session this morning with the six lobe lavash? That makes me a little queasy. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you. So um, now it's my pleasure to invite up Emily Scala. She's a research assistant at Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital and Medical Center, and we're going to stay with the big data. We're going to switch over to proteomics. Thank you, Emily. Um, as Emily said, I'm Emily. I'm a research assistant in Dr. Ziadi's lab at Cincinnati Children's in the Division of Bone Marrow Transplantation. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present our work. Dr. Ziadi and Mrs. Scala are inventors on a patent related to this presentation. First, a little background. The G551D study was a multi-center observational study of patients six years and older with at least one G551D mutation about to start Ivacaftor. At six months, there was a mean change in FEV1% predicted of 6.7% and a mean improvement of sweat chloride of negative 54 milliequivalent per liter. However, in patients with a physiological drug response, as indicated by a change in sweat chloride of negative 80 to negative 60, which is outlined in pink, 30 to 50% did not have improvement in FEV1. So let me tell you about our premise. Our premise was that we know there are differences in lung function response to modulators. And we know that there are differences in lungs due to severity with non-genetic factors. So then we thought about a proteomic approach. We hypothesized that protein differences in blood will re be related to lung function response to drug at six months. So the goal study set of samples was great for us to look at. And we selected our samples based on the six month response to drug. We requested baseline one month and six month plasma samples from the goal study from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Biorepository from subjects with evidence of six month sweat chloride drug response of negative 80 to negative 60 milliequivalent per liter and a baseline FEV1% predicted 64 to 84 to avoid sealing effect for non-response. Non we defined lung function response at six months as an increase in FEV1% predicted greater than five. And for the purpose of this study, for simplicity, we will refer to the cohort with lung function response less than five as lung function non-responders, but this is not to say at all that they did not have any improvement or response to drug. And I'd like to point out that the samples that were available were not at every time point for each subject. Now, what we did with these samples was first they were blinded and randomized by the Office of Clinical and Translational Research so that we were blind to all of the data. And then our proteomic approach was performed. First, the albumin was depleted in the whole plasma protein. It was fractionated by SDS gel electrophoresis, and an in-gel digestion was performed, and triptych peptides were extracted. We used a liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry based label free quantitation. The spectra were searched against a human FASTA database using Proteum Discoverer software and differentially expressed protein isoforms in lung function non responders and sustained responders were identified using heterostatistic students' t test. Our standard cutoff analysis was with a protein sequest score cutoff of five 
and our higher stringency cutoff analysis was with a protein sequest score cutoff of 20. This protein sequest score is based on the level of correlation of the observed versus the theoretical peptide spectra, all for that protein. Then Metacore pathway analysis software was used. The standard cutoff, the reason that we use both of them is because the standard cutoff can give us the big picture of what's going on and the higher stringency cutoff is a more substantial, but it looks at a lot less data. And both analysis are acceptable for discovery data sets. And this is how I'm going to present our data. We're going to be discussing lung function non-responders and sustained responders. I will first discuss our results at baseline prior to the initiation of IVACAFTR, then at one month, and finally at six months after the initiation of IVACAFTR. Here are some of the differences we discovered in our analysis at baseline. First, I'm going to give you a zoomed out view of some different processes that were revealed in our standard cutoff analysis at baseline. We see associations with cellular differentiation and proliferation, angiogenesis and wound healing, and remodeling and cell adhesion. Our network software analysis our network analysis software connected proteins involved in all of these processes to create one network, and this is what it looks like. Now, at first glance, one might get a little frizzled mm -hmm. by this image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> at this point, my boys would be like, stop it, mommy. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot going on in this picture, but I'll walk you through it. This is one network from our standard cutoff build of networks, and this build of networks created 26 networks, all with p-values less than 0.02. The red circle by the protein indicates that it's upregulated in lung function non-responders, and the blue circles indicate that the proteins are downregulated. Uh, wind signaling pathways are involved in a lot of processes like cell differentiation and proliferation. And CD44 is involved in wound healing and inflammation. CJUN is a transcription factor involved in inflammation, proliferation, and cell death. And ecagterin is a junctional, pro junctional protein and is involved in cell adhesion. Another way to look at the data is to look at the gene ontology processes, which tell us physiologically what's associating with our data. Gene ontology has more than 28,000 biological processes, and it's pretty amazing that these are what were associated as the top 10 processes for each cutoff based on p-value. And their p-value is shown as the negative log where the blue dashed line is equal to 0.05. Our analysis at baseline reveals cellular organization, cell migration, and cilium movement, neurological development, glycolysis and energetics, and protein modification and protein localization to an organelle. And so in summary, at baseline, differentially expressed protein isoforms associate with wound healing, cell adhesion, migration and cilium movement, and inflammation. We also observe some evidence of pathways involved in neurological development. It's interesting that wound healing and cell adhesion and migration are consistent with what, ha what we know happens in CF and inflammatory responses and structural remodeling. And cilium movement is consistent with mucociliary clearance. Here are some of the differences we discovered at one month. Again, the zoomed out view with some different processes that were revealed in our stringent cutoff analysis at one month. We see associations with inflammation and insulin metabolism, 
cell proliferation, migration and development, and G551D CFTR activation. Our network analysis software connected these proteins into processes, involved in these processes to create one network. And this is it, with our stringent cutoff at one month after the initiation of IVIC after. The red circles, again, show what's upregulated in lung function non-responders, and the blue is what's downregulated. This network analysis created 11 separate networks, all with p-values less than 0 0.004. We again see C. June, the transcription factor involved in inflammation, proliferation, and cell death. USP19, which is involved in proteolysis. And NF kappa beta, which is involved in a lot of processes, including pro inflammatory signaling and proliferation. And here are some physiological processes associated with the data. These are our top 10 GO processes out of the 28,000 biological processes in gene ontology using our standard cutoff based on p-value, again, listed as the negative log of p-value. Our analysis at one month continues to be associated with cellular organization and remodeling and neurological development. In summary, at one month, We see continued associations with cell adhesion and migration, inflammation, G551D CFTR activation, and we also continue to observe associations with neurological development. And we continue to see processes which we feel are consistent with what we know happens in CF, cell adhesion, migration, and inflammatory responses. And here's what we see at six months. Again, the zoomed out view of different processes. We see host viral response, cell proliferation and differentiation, inflammatory and complement, act, complement pathways, and cell adhesion. And the network it creates is this one, which this network analysis created 22 separate networks with p-values less than 0 0.009. We again see CJUN and Integrin, which is involved in antigen presentation, inflammation, and differentiation. And here are the physiological processes that were involved. The top 10 include cellular organization and migration, cell differentiation and development, and associations with neurological development, and new associations with female reproductive development and DNA damage response. In summary, at six months, we see associations with cell adhesion and migration, host viral response, complement activation, and female reproductive development, and continued associations with neurological development. Our overall conclusion, or first, are some limitations of our study are that our MS proteomics employed here are semi-quantitative, and our stringent data set is limited by the higher cutoff. The sample number is limited also. So in conclusion, our protein differences are detectable prior to the initiation of IVACAFTR when comparing lung function responders and non-responders, and it continues throughout six months. Differences are associated with wound healing, host viral response, cell migration, and ciliary movement. We also see G551D activation, and interestingly, we find associations with neurogenesis and female reproductive development. I find it promising that cell adhesion, structural remodeling, and inflammation associate it with differentially expressed proteins at every time point, which leads me to our future work. In the future, we plan to expand our study population to analyze lung function response with different modulators and also explore potential co-therapies and or pretreatments to optimize the efficacy of highly effective modulator therapy. I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Ziadi, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Biorepository, and Dr. J.P. Clancy, the Office of Clinical and Translational Research um, for blinding our samples, 
Dr. Sonia Helchi for assisting with sample selection, the Ziadi Lab, especially Matthew Seifert, the NIH and CFF for supporting this research, and Dr. Stella Davies and the CCHMC bone marrow transplant program for being so supportive. Thank you. So we actually, we actually did have a small group of samples that we called non-sustained responders. So they had improvement at one month, but then they went back down at six months. So each group was separated out depending on, based on their six month response. So if they were in one group, they didn't change into another group. Right now, we only had four samples at baseline, three at one month and two at six month time points. So we just didn't have enough data to present today. We need to try to get some more samples in that, in that, in that cohort. Thank how, you. How about late responders? Did you see any of those? Um, we did not have any late responders. So we did not see anyone in our cohorts that had no improvement at one month and then had improvement at six months. So if there was no improvement at one month, they did not improve later on. Any other questions? A whole bunch right there. These are these new ones? No. Well, I think they just oh. So has anybody sent any questions into the app? Because we seem to be failing no. in finding the them. Yeah, so I guess they're from the old one. Okay, great. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> I think you planned it. Um, <laughs> All right, we're going to continue to talk about inflammation um, some more, especially with modulator response. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Nicola Robinson. Uh, she's a pulmonologist at the Scottish Adult Cystic Fibrosis Unit and a clinical research fellow at the Center for Inflammation, uh, Inflammation Research at the University of Edinburgh. I had to get my slides up. Oh, just click on me. And then you click there. Start. Okay. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> um, you click on that. Okay. Hold it. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Hi everybody, um, my name is Nicola Robinson. I'm a clinical research fellow at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and I'd like to thank the organisers for allowing us to present some of our data today. Apologies in advance to anyone who's at Robert Gray's talk on Thursday morning as he's already given you some of the highlights of this but hopefully you'll take um, some, a few things away with you from this talk. Let me see. So I've no, uh, no disclosures relevant for this talk. So we know that cystic fibrosis is a disease of persistent and non-resolving inflammation, and it's a complex interplay with the immune system, the airway epithelium and pathogens. And just a short walk around the poster sessions upstairs will show you just how many cells are involved in this. And what everyone's biggest question at the minute is how do CFTR modulators affect this? And that drove us um, to wonder this and wonder what happens to both systemic and pulmonary inflammation in those people with CF starting highly effective CFT or modulator therapy. My work began in September 2019, so Europe was a little um, behind the curve in taking up CFTR modulators and um, Tezaiva therapy was only released in September 2019 in Scotland. So we began collecting blood samples, nasal brushings and uh, clinical data from our patients starting. And then approximately one year later, we had Alex Tezaiva um, introduced into our clinic. And again, we collected those research samples, but also recruited 10 patients to undergo um, HRCTs of their chest. 
And this was important to look at because we want to see the difference between partial CFTR correction and um, the, the kind of highly effective CFTR correction as well. So all in all, since 2019, we've recruited 103 patients in total. Um, and as per any kind of adult clinic, we have a median age of 29. We've more males than females um, with just over 50, uh, 50 odd percent. Um, and the vast majority of those starting had at least one copy of the Delta 508 um, gene. And firstly, if we look at our clinical outcomes with Tezcafter Ivacafter, it was similar to what had been seen in clinical trials. We had a small, modest improvement in um, FEV1 of, on average, 2% um, up at, um, at the three-month mark. But as you can see, there, were, uh, there was a vast array of responses. Some people did incredibly well and some people just didn't respond at all. Interestingly, um, most people gained about two kilos of weight in the first three months of their Tezaiva treatment. And lung function wasn't everything. The respiratory CFQR scores did improve um, significantly, even within the first month of Tezaiva therapy. However, this was dwarfed with what we saw when we released Alex Tezaiva to our patient cohort, um, with a marked improvement in FEV1 of about 12%. Interestingly, the weight improvements in our patients were fairly dramatic, with men gaining on average a stone in the first three months and women half a stone in the first three months of therapy. Um, and that this was all kind of pre-peri-pandemic, kind of peri -pandemic, so it wasn't just people sitting in their houses and, and taking up baking and things. Um, equally, the respiratory CFQR scores were markedly better as well. So we decided to do some exploratory work um, with our Tezcafter Ivacafter cohort initially. And we wanted to look across the cytokines at um, what really changed and what was important um, to take us forward into the Alexcafter Tezcafter Ivacafter era. And interestingly, the only one that was um, significantly different from healthy controls and improved significantly with treatment was IL-6. So we decided to look at IL-6, IL-8 and IL-10 as those had the biggest differences um, compared to healthy controls. But as you can see, the other cytokines all did appear to come down, uh, just not significantly. There's a downward trend in the vast majority. So we moved forward into our cohort with Alex Tezaiva therapy over the first three months of treatment. And as you can see, again, IL-6 was the only, um, only one to significantly come down. IL-8 and IL-10 did not improve. IL-6 drives CRP production and all of our patients at clinic got a CRP done on their clinical bloods. So we had many more samples for this. And as you can see, it drops significantly and remains uh, low at the three month mark. And interestingly, when we take IL-6 and CRP out to a year, both of these stay down significantly um, from where they had been at baseline. We then decided to go on an exploratory um, search again using Olink proteomics uh, to look at 96 proteins related to inflammation, 96 related to organ damage and repair. And as you can see, there's not a, a lot of correlation between the treatment naive and the treated um, uh, samples. Interestingly, there were only three significant results. Again, IL-6 came out at the top with IL-20 and MMP10 joining it. And why is IL-6 important in CF? So not only does it have important immune functions, it's also uh, it causes impaired bacterial clearance in high, um, high doses, and we also, it's also implicated in fatigue. So this may explain some of the reason why we uh, see so much more vitality in our patients coming back initially, having been treated with Lex Cafter, Tes Cafter, and Ive Cafter therapy. Additionally, it has impact on osteoclast activity. And with so many of our patients having bone disease and living longer, we may see changes in the longer term. Additionally, it causes inte intestinal epithelial turnover and tumorigenesis. So we're yet to see what impact this might have on colon cancer rates going forward. No talk from Edinburgh would be complete without discussing calprotectin. Um, which is released from activated, disrupted or dying neutrophils and is a biomarker of infection, inflammation and exacerbation in not just CF, but many other neutrophilic diseases. So again, starting with our Tezcafter and Ivacafter cohort, very little change was seen within the first three months of treatment um, with Tez therapy, which 
compared to the changes that we saw with alexacaftor, tezacaftor and ivacaftor therapy across the first year of treatment is quite dramatic. We saw a significant reduction in calprotectin at uh, the one year time point. Interestingly, if you look at the one year um, TESIVA data, there is a reduction, but it is not significant. And if we look at those switching from TESIVA over to Alex TESIVA, actually they do see a stepwise approach. So some correction of CFTR does improve their calprotectin levels. And interestingly, if we compare that to those who were modulator naive, um, we do see a marked reduction in those who had not had any modulator before, and they immediately go down to the level seen at those who had been um, on TESIVA before. And by the three month mark, everyone is at an equal playing field. Sadly, neither calprotectin nor IL-6 correlate with um, an improvement in lung function. So um, we can't say that they are specific biomarkers to predict who is going to improve or not improve um, from a, an FEV1 point of view. In terms of our CT imaging cohort, we used 10 patients. Uh, with seven males and three females uh, with the median age of 32. Everyone had one copy of the Delta F508 gene. And we used kind of moderate um, and mild uh, FEV1 starting points with the range from 45% up to 89% as their starting FEV1s. And as you can see, if you look at this graph, uh, let me just get a pointer. Is that going to... If you look at this graph, we have some people who responded very well and some people who didn't respond at all. But interestingly, again, their weight went up quite dramatically with one person gaining two and a half stone in the first year of treatment. So um, this is one of the cross-sectional images from one of our more severe patients. For those of you who are maybe a little less used to looking at um, CT scans of the lungs, generally speaking, black is good, it's air filled and white is bad and it tends to be mucus filled. So again, if I get my laser pointer, you can see an area of mucus plugging, a large cavity here, um, dilated bronchioles with thick walls. Um, and this edge here, it probably doesn't project terribly well, but tree and bud bronchial excess, so that's inflammation in the small airways of the lung. And as you can see, after a year of therapy, there's a marked reduction in the cavity size of that um, in the cavity. Those thickened walls have become much thinner and if you can convince yourself uh, on the big screen, this looks a little bit more black than it did previously. And if we take you through a video of one of our, um, just go back to see if I can get this to work. Get rid of the laser printer. If we take you through a video, hopefully if this will work for me, of um, one of our patients. Um, if I give it a minute, it might work for me. Um, there we go. You'll see the reduction in inflammation throughout their lungs and a, actually an improvement in bronchiectasis in the basal segments. Again, white is bad, black is good. And sadly today, we don't have our AI analysis as yet, but I thought I would summarize the changes that we've seen on these CT scans. Um, so improvement in bronchiectasis was seen in four of the 10 patients at one year. Improvement in bronchial wall thickening and mucus plugging was seen in everybody. Only one patient had a cavitating lesion, and as you've seen already, that improved by the one year of treatment. Tree in bud bronchiolectasis was seen in nine of 10 at baseline and though that had improved in eight of those patients at one year. And very interestingly, size significant mediastinal lymph lymphadenopathy was seen in eight of 10 at baseline. This isn't something that has ever been included in um, CT scoring systems for CF before, but we saw an improvement in six of the eight people at one year of therapy. Um, suggesting that there's just a decrease in um, the number of immune cells being recruited into the lungs. So in conclusion, um, treatment with Alextez IVA significantly improves systemic markers of inflammation, including calprotectin, and we have seen radiological improvements in all of our cohort who underwent CT scanning. 
I would like to thank uh, Robert Gray and our lab, as well as Stuart Forbes, who's my uh, co-supervisor. Additionally, um, the Scottish Adult CF team and all of our patients who've taken part, as well as my charity funders and the MRC for funding this research. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, do you have um, data on their sim You mentioned how pe how much better yeah. some people feel. Yep. Do you have data on how they feel? Or yes, um, we've not. I've not included that today. But we did CFQR scores. Um, so I've only I've only shown you, and that gives you a twelve domain um, improvement. I've only given the respiratory one in that. So that's the one we saw the biggest improvements in. But actually, um, eleven of the twelve domains improved with um, Alexa's IVA treatment within one month. The only one that we didn't see improvement in was digestive. Um, so everything else improved. Uh, vitality and um, you know vitality markers and um, kind of a series of other markers improved fairly dramatically within the first month. So why, what's going on with lung function? Is the <laughs> straggler not related to? Um, there may be a number of confounding factors when you're dealing with adults with CF. So quite a lot of patients towards a year have stopped some of their other therapies or pulled back on things because they, um, we call it CAFTRIO, but Trikafta has been so effective uh, over the first few months that they think, oh, actually, I don't need to do the rest of my inhaled therapies. And you see their lung function drift down over the course of that year. So um, we think it's probably a combination of adherence as well as, um, <laughs> as, well as maybe just changes in how they take things. Fascinating. Go ahead. Okay. I can't. All right. Uh, so we have a question online here uh, from Mara. Um, she's asking if you look deeper at the OLINK data, does it track by individual? For um, example, does it does it reflect improvement in FEV1 and weight gain? Um, we don't have that data yet. I haven't probed it in in too much detail, but. Um, the, if you look actually back at the O-Link, they do um, kind of cluster together, so they're pre and post do cluster. Um, so I I can't tell you for definite if there's a specific um, a specific protein that would just improve in the high improvers rather than those who don't improve that well. I have a question on the imaging. Yeah. Um, so how how plastic are the you know air trapping? Like if you look at the same patient over time, you showed mm -hmm. uh, data when you looked at a patient before they went on Teza and then or the track after, and then you looked a year later. Yeah. Um, if, if you were just doing it without any kind of comparison to therapy or post-therapy, um, how plastic are area trapping regions and so on in the lung? Do they change from image to image, uh, imaging session to imaging session, or is that something that stays pretty stable? It, it should stay pretty stable in oh. adult disease because bronchiectasis is there and established. Um, certainly kind of all of our patients have established bronchiectasis, so it's not like you're seeing kind of a sudden improvement or um, in kind of air trapping areas. So the specific regions will stay around for a while until you yeah. have an actual improvement. Okay. Yeah, the resolution of that cavity is it's really phenomenal. remarkable. Yeah. Um, question from the audience. Can you, can you comment on the time course of change in the inflammation markers? Do we have to wait a whole year? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> um, we just from uh, speaking to patients they see massive changes within a couple of days um, we know that you can probably see changes within patients uh, lung function within the first two weeks um, we anticipate that there is something happening infl inflammatory wise that even at one month may be too late um, so we just don't know for definite but um, every every time we've looked at this the changes tend to happen quickly and then stay low Yes, we did, did actually. Oh, um, she was asking, did we um, track pulmonary exacerbations pre and post? Um, so we have looked at um, we've looked at um, exacerbations pre and post just at three months, and there's a marked reduction. So um, anyone who works in uh, clinical medicine in the last year in CF will see a massive reduction. Interestingly, this is obviously a very unusual time to be doing it with people wearing a lot more, you know, certainly in the last couple of years wearing masks and things as well. So that may confine to it a bit, but certainly we saw at least a 75% reduction in um, exacerbations from the three months prior. And for us, um, certainly you could, you could see there that our patients started in, uh, kind of between September and Christmas of last year, uh, or of 2020, sorry. 
Um, so it, they had mostly been shielding indoors before that. Um, so even the exacerbation rate dropping kind of quite dramatically from that just shows you that um, even when they hadn't been kind of seeing a lot of people picking up viral infections or um, just bacterial infections in general, there is a, a big reduction. Okay. That's it for questions. Thanks. 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 Excellent. Thanks, Nicole. Great. Thank you. We're going to stay with the theme and twist a little bit toward the liver. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Christine Hota, um, who is uh, a physician at the um, Copenhagen CF Center in Denmark. I went too loud on the O. It was very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Christine Hoyd and I'm a medical doctor and a PhD fellow at the Copenhagen Cystic Fibrosis Center. And I am here today to present our study, Change in Liver Markers after the introduction of Alexa Kafta, Tessa Kafta, Iva Kafta. And just so I won't have to say that again, I'll say ETI from now on. <laughs> And these are the results from our 12-month follow-up study in the Danish cystic fibrosis cohort. And these are my disclosures. We know cystic fibrosis to be a multi-organ disease with a genetic mutation causing fecund mucus in both the lungs, pancreas, intestine, and so on, and also in the liver. And due to the latest improvement in lung and nutrition status in patients with CF, the, after the introduction of ETI, the focus of care is shifting um, to include other causes of mortality, such as cystic fibrosis-related liver disease. And what do we know about cystic fibrosis-related liver disease, or CFLD? Significant liver disease has been increasingly recognized in the CF population and is today the third most frequent cause of mortality in CF. We know that there are varying prevalences ranging from uh, 5 to 10 percent and all the way up to 40 percent, depending on the method of diagnosis and the variability in uh, expression and severity of symptoms. As most CFLD is asymptomatic and without any reliable biomarkers until the stage of advanced liver disease, the prevalence of CFLD is probably underestimated and very often late diagnosed. It is also well known, and we have heard it several times at this conference, um, including in the liver session on Thursday, CFLD represents a risk predictor of an unfavorable prognosis and development of CF with more and longer hospital and medicines, worse nutrition status and worse lung function. Currently, there are no specific biomarkers that consistently predict um, the development of CFLD. And so what is this uh, new super drug we're all talking about and what does it do to the liver? Uh, CF transmembrane regulator modulators or CFTR modulators. While previous studies have shown significant benefits with regards to lung function and nutrition status, they have also demonstrated the potential for hepatotoxicity and this was evidenced by elevations in transaminases and in bilirubin. In paradox to this, very few data documenting liver outcomes whilst on highly effective modulator treatments have been reported, probably due to the fact that severe liver disease was an exclusion criteria on most safety studies, making hepatic impact very poorly categorized. Denmark was among the first European countries to um, provide free access to ETI, and ETI was approved for CF patients above 12 years in September 2020. Therefore, we decided to do this study, and our objective was to assess changes in liver biomarkers after the introduction of CFTR modulators in patients with CF. And what did we do? 
We included uh, all patients from our unselected national cohort from both of two centers in Denmark. And patients were above 12 years and of course started on ETI. We excluded patients with previous solid organ transplantations and we did a panel of well-known biomarkers and these included ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase, GGT, hemoglobin, white blood cell count, thrombocytes and bilirubin. We did uh, blood samples at baseline one month, three months, six months, nine months and 12 months. And as an indicator of hepatic status, uh, we allocated patients into two groups based on their level of alkaline phosphatase at baseline. And alkaline phosphatase was chosen as the best available marker of cholestasis. We, um, changes were assessed using a mixed effect model and adjusted, of course, for sex and age. And these are our results, uh, or the baseline characteristics. In total, we had 331 patients. There was a median age of 27 years and roughly 50% uh, females and males. 73% were homozygotes for the F508 DEL and about 76, 77, 36, 37 percent had an abnormal uh, alkaline phosphatase at baseline. And when looking at uh, the results here, you can see on the y-axis you have the time on ETI and on the x-axis you have the ALT. And you can see represented in blue, that's the uh, normal hepatic status groups defined as having a normal alkaline phosphatase at baseline. And in purple, you can see the group having a alkaline phosphatase above upper limit of normal at baseline. And you can see that in both groups, there was an increase in ALT, uh, especially toward the first six months after this levels uh, stabilized and all levels were kept well within normal range. You can see here that for the normal hepatic status group there was an increase of 7.8% during the first six months of treatment. We also looked at bilirubin and you can see here that in both groups uh, levels of bilirubin uh, increased within the first six months but again they stabilized after the first six months and was still kept well within the normal range when looking at gender and age specific range. You can see that for the normal hepatic status group, there was an increase of 17% throughout the first six months. And for the abnormal hepatic group, there was an increase of almost 16%. We also looked at uh, GGT. And you can see that the normal uh, hepatic status group, the group in blue, they were generally, they had a lower GGT and they also kept being low. The group with the abnormal hepatic status at baseline had a higher GGT at baseline and they actually declined with almost 18% throughout the first year of treatment. When looking at platelets, we saw a decline in both groups, but again stabilized after the first six months and was still within normal range. The normal group had a decline of 10% and the abnormal hepatic status group had a decline of 11%. We also used the GGT to platelet ratio, the GPR which is a liver fibrosis indices often used or has been shown to be potentially useful in both the detection and the monitoring in CFLD. And you can see here that in both groups, there were no overall change uh, in GPR from baseline to 12 months of treatments. So what have we learned? We have in this study studied the effect of triple modulator therapy in patients with cystic fibrosis. And although generally well tolerated, hepatotoxicity has been described as an adverse event, as an adverse event in previous clinical trials. 
We therefore set out to look at the long-term effect of CFTR modulators and found in this study that after one year of treatment, ETI was generally well tolerated and this also included patients with abnormal hepatic status at baseline. We found an initial rise in ALT and bilirubin, but levels stabilized after the first six months and was still kept well within normal range. This could, of course, indicate an initial drug-induced hepatic impact, but also shows that the clinical reason for concern is minor as markers generally stabilize over time. We also found that GGT declined in patients with abnormal hepatic status at baseline, um, which could, uh, as has been suggested by other trials, suggest that there was a beneficial effect on CFLD from ETI. And with regard to further research, we would of course like to combine our biochemical results with imaging and elastigraphy. And as patients with CF live longer, the risk of adverse events uh, of antipathic injury from various medications will likely increase with long-term use. We therefore would like to include polypharmacy and look um, into st further study the long-term effects of CFTR modulators beyond the one year of treatment. More information is generally needed to understand the effect of polypharmacy and ETI over a lifetime. And last but not least, I would of course like to thank the conference committee for the opportunity to be here today. And I would like to thank all the wonderful people working with me on this project. And I welcome questions. Thanks for your great talk. You're welcome. <laughs> no questions. Questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I've got one. Great. Do you think there was uh, any association with the delivery of observation or any of the other markers that were elevated for the particular polymorphisms of the genetic related predicts? Um we haven't looked into it yet. We've only just gotten the one year results, but there could of course be some um some medication that we haven't thought about in designing the study that could um, affect the bilirubin. But when we designed the, the whole study, we of course looked at polypharmacy before and didn't find any known um, medication that would indicate that this was a problem. No, we had a few um, where we had to either reduce dose or pause the dose and then restart it. Uh, we also had a few with well-known uh, liver impact before started, starting, which were then uh, initiated on ETI on lower doses and with a sort of step up um, regime. Can you repeat the question? Um, yeah, so I, I guess what you're asking is that did we take in, do the, do the numbers take into the account that the papers, that. yeah. These numbers are, well, we made a model to see on the general population how all our liver biochemical results um, would well, looked in a total, so they are included in the data, but because we, had so, we have so many time points, they are not, um, this is more looking at the general development of the biomarkers. So they're included, but they're, they're not standing out because they were so few. No, we've, we've seen no severe cases uh, in that degree. And that's, that's true, there has been uh, specific cases where, where immediate drug-induced uh, uh, hepatotoxicity were seen, and that is, of course, very relevant to be aware of. 
Can you teach us pulmonologists, what do you, how does the imaging work? Like what's the next step in the study? Um, we did ultra ultrasound at baseline and again at one year. So we will of course be looking at the, ultras the liver ultrasound and, and see how it changed. And we also did uh, elastography measurements um, to see if we could uh, detect um, a change from baseline to 12 months and to see if the fibrosis had changed and this will be very relevant to look at. We don't have the result of that one yet, but we will compare it to the biomarkers as soon as we have it. And elastography gives you an estimate of percent fibrosis? Yeah, it gives us an estimate of uh, not exactly percent, the liver but stiffness. yeah, the liver stiffness uh, yeah. as an indicator of how much fibrosis the patient would have. Did you have a question? Well, I was just going to ask if you can think of other biomarkers that may be, uh, may be more sensitive than the ones you're using. So the ones you're using are, you know, the classical ones for liver failure. But are there better markers that may be indicating changes in the liver um, that wouldn't be a thing you want to happen in CF? Um, we did, we, uh, maybe we very sensitive. specifically decided on these biomarkers to, because as you say, they are the general biomarkers, because we wanted it to be as overall as, poss as possibly mm -hmm. and as much um, afflictable on other uh, patient groups where you don't necessarily do specific biomarkers. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're thinking of a specific one or... Well, you know, maybe maybe markers that associate with like that vasculopathy, which is, seems to be something if you, I don't know if you went to the liver, um, the hep hepatology uh, talk, a couple of days ago on at the date. session, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it seems like that's a, a, a theme that there's a vasculopathy that, yeah. that's a hallmark of CF liver disease, and it does seem to be different than other types of liver disease. So. True, we didn't do any of those okay. specific markers, no. Okay, that's very good, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that great talk, and um, we're going to change gears just a little bit and talk about lung function and oscillometry. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Elpis, who is an associate professor of pediatrics at the Aristotle University in Greece. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work. Uh, this is a quite different uh, topic from the one that we heard before. Um, I have nothing to disclose related to the study. Uh, so, uh, the classical uh, uh, forced oscill oscillation the technique parameters uh, are resistant and reactants, but they have the disadvantage of being corrected for lung volume uh, at uh, which they are measured. Uh, so we're going to present a novel uh, FOT index, uh, which is the specific respiratory uh, system conductance, which might overcome this uh, important limitation. So I'm going to give some uh, overview about the um, FOT. Uh, we know that uh, this uh, technique um, assesses the mechanical properties of the um, lungs and um, it is performed uh, um, uh, during uh, quite uh, tidal breathing. It does not, uh, 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 we do not uh, need uh, the special collaboration from the patient uh, that um, performs uh, oscillometry. Um, so depending on the um, different frequencies that uh, we um, give uh, to the, we apply to the, uh, to the patient, we can assess the mechanics of uh, large or smaller ways, as we can see in the graph. And we assess uh, resistant and, and reactance. And uh, here we can uh, see that in the normal patients, in the normal, in the, 
sorry, the healthy uh, people, the resistance uh, uh, reflects central and peripheral airways, while reactance uh, reflects elasticity and peripheral airways and cystic fibrosis. Because of we have um, peripheral, peripheral obstruction and dynamic uh, collapse, we have increased resistance and uh, decreased uh, reactance. Uh, in this graph, we can see the relation between uh, resistance and uh, conductance uh, compared to the lung volume. And we can know that uh, we have a linear uh, correlationship between the specific uh, conductance and the lung volume. So, specific respiratory conductance was calculated uh, as a reciprocal of um, uh, resistance at 5 Hz uh, multiplied by the, the FRC. So, by this way, it uh, becomes uh, theoretically dependent on the lagging uh, volume at uh, which it, it is measured. We all, uh, we all know the well-established uh, in clinical practice uh, lung clearance index that it uh, uh, assesses <coughs> the dilation in, homo in homogeneity among patients with cystic fibrosis. So the aim of our study was to determine for the first time the specific respiratory conductance in patients with cystic fibrosis and related to the severity of uh, lung disease. We uh, evaluated 44 patients with cystic fibrosis. They all underwent uh, spirometry, multiple breath was out. Uh, FOT uh, and um, the out outcome parameters were, were uh, FEV1Z score, LCI, and the other parameters of uh, multiple breath was out as, as uh, well as uh, specific uh, respiratory conductance. We can see here the, that the mean age of the patients was uh, 16 uh, years, half of them were males, more or less they, have, uh, they, had, they presented with uh, uh, normal lung function, uh, a little elevated LCI and uh, elevated um, resistance. Uh, but uh, on the right, we can see that uh, the specific uh, respiratory conductance was strongly correlated with LCI. And we can, as we can also see in these graphs, uh, it was also strongly correlated with the other parameters of uh, multiple breath was out and moderate, moderate, mo moderately correlated with uh, FEV1Z score. Uh, moreover, we found that um, specific respiratory conductance uh, was a significant predictor of LCI and the other parameters of multiple breath was out, independently of uh, FEV1Z score and age. So we come to the conclusion that in patients uh, with uh, cystic fibrosis, specific respira uh, respira um, respiratory conductance is consistent with ventilation in, in homogeneity and relates closely uh, to the severity of lung disease. So this could be a novel and easy uh, way to obtain uh, this index that um, uh, and improve uh, cystic fibrosis monitoring uh, in an outpatient uh, setting in an easy and uh, cheap way. Thank you very much. What's the time to, for a patient to do LCI versus FOT in clinic? Um, How long does it take? It takes about uh, 10 minutes to perform the um, uh, multiple breath was out and uh, about uh, three minutes to perform the FOT. So it's much shorter. Yeah. And can, can your younger patients do it? You didn't, uh, the lower limit was? The lower limit was five, but um, uh, still there, um, we haven't been practicing with uh, younger ones, to be honest, but uh, there are some publications and um, my, uh, my colleague that uh, works in Patra University, because we did that in collaboration, he performs that in neonates and uh, infants as well. What brand equipment do you use? <laughs> Sorry? What brand oscillometer do you have? The Resmond. Uh, oh, sorry. Would you Did like you me to... Do you have a picture oh, of it? Uh, yes. Just a moment. Okay. Questions from Any the audience? Questions? 
Could you? Oh, we have one. Could you go back? Oh, yeah. To, yeah, yeah sorry. You click on your name and then click start. Ah, okay, sorry. Wait, did you click on your name? Yeah, this yeah. yeah, that's it. Okay, just to show you the picture. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. There it is. Okay. So this is the equipment. That's there. The so it's a resmed. Oh, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. pointer, the red one. Pointer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then, yeah. So this is yeah. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh -huh. And this is the um, Rashmon Prof. So this is the equipment we use. Okay. Rashmon Prof full. This is the equipment. Okay. Okay. Oh, Rashmon. Okay. Yes. So we got a question from Mar. The question is, did you measure a bronchodilator response with the FOT? Uh, no, in this uh, study we just um, uh, uh, performed uh, FOT measurement and then uh, uh, multiple breath was out and spirometry. And we didn't uh, see whether there was a, a response to bronchodilators. Uh, Mara asked a question, has F uh, FOT been used pre and post hemp? Post high uh, efficacy modulator therapy. Have you looked before and after people have gotten trichapta? No, uh, we used to perform some uh, measurements, uh, FOT measurements, uh, some years ago, but this was the first uh, time we okay. uh, uh, tried to do measurements uh, and, uh, correlated with the disease severity, but we didn't assess before and after uh, ETI. Okay. And there's also another question from Julian Allen. Um, did you also look at conductance um, not corrected for lung volume? Uh, no, we didn't. Okay. You want to do this last one? Yeah. Oh, this is a good question. Do, um, what order did the patients do things in clinic? Did they do the FOT before? Spirometry and the, then LCI? They performed the uh, FOT and then LCI and then spirometry. Okay. <laughs> yes, in the back. <laughs> Thank you for the question. I think uh, I can uh, go and uh, calculate that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Very nice Thank you. Yeah, we used more FOT in our institution when at the early COVID because um, some of our research protocols weren't allowed to use spirometry because of um, particle generating and FOT is not particle generating. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that it? That's it. Yeah, great. All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for the very fabulous talks on all um, types of biomarkers. I feel like we were teased all week talking about what biomarkers we're going to need um, now with modulators. And uh, thank you for staying. Um, thank you for coming from all around the globe to present. And have on fun Saturday afternoon. And have fun tonight if you go to the set to the to the to the function or uh, travel safely on the way back home. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>